Thank you very much, Bonnie. And thank you to the National Park Service for inviting me to speak to you here tonight. Um, it's fall, so of course, everybody's thoughts immediately turn to the flu. And I thought before we uh, get started, I would do a little flu uh, quiz with you folks. So um, who can tell me when flu season usually starts? We're in September now, we're getting close. October. Actually, the flu season generally gets started in October. Um, it peaks uh, between December and February and then goes uh, through the spring. And I'll call out some months. And so let's have a show of hands for when people think flu season generally ends. March? Nope. Very good. April? A few hands. Nope. May? Yes. That's the correct answer. It can run uh, as late as May. So um, I've got another uh, little question that I'll, that I'll uh, quiz that I'll give you towards the end of the, end of the talk. But anyway, I'm here to, today to talk to you about uh, influenza viruses in marine mammals in Southern California, primarily at the Channel Islands, and uh, some work that my colleagues and I have been doing. I want to acknowledge Dr. Brent Stewart, who's in the audience tonight. Um, he's been working with me on this, on this project. Oops, try going off and then on again. There we go. Oops, went too many. There we go, okay, thanks. Um, there was a power outage a little bit earlier tonight, so maybe there's a few gremlins left in the system. I wanted to uh, first tell you a little bit about our research uh, institute, Hub Sea World Research Institute. As Bonnie mentioned, we're based in San Diego, and we are a nonprofit uh, 501c3 public charity uh, research organization. We were founded in 1963, and our mission statement is to return to the sea some measure of the benefits derived from it. We have several areas of research expertise, as you can see on the slide here. And in particular, um, my colleague, Dr. Stewart, and I have uh, been working with marine mammals in the Channel Islands and elsewhere in the Southern California Bight since the 1970s. Um, some of the work, most of the work that we do is at the Channel Islands. So here's Brent with an elephant seal at uh, San Miguel Island. And this is me working on my master's thesis research on harbor seals at San Miguel. Uh, we also do a a little bit of work on the Central California coast. So here we are in the San Simeon area. And although most of our work is on pinnipeds, we have done some work on, on cetaceans off the coast as well. Um, we did a study a few years ago on gray whales looking at their behavior in and around natural oil slicks. Um, I hope uh, all of you have seen the Treasure in the Sea movie that is in the visitor center here at the National Park. If you haven't, I encourage you to see it talks a little bit about the success story of uh, seal and sea lion populations really have been growing in the past uh, decades. And Dr. Stewart actually gave a, one of the shore to sea lectures in 2015 that talked all about the history of the pinniped populations at the island. So if you're interested in, in going back and taking a look at that if you'd like more information. So this is a question that I get asked a lot. Uh, why study viruses in marine mammals? Well, one reason is because I'm a veterinarian and so I'm interested in, in animal health. And marine mammals are, of course, I'm interested in wildlife populations, so free-ranging marine mammals. Um, we're also interested in uh, diseases in stranded animals. Um, hundreds of animals come ashore each year uh, stranded and we need to evaluate their health. And then there are a fair number of marine mammals in California and elsewhere in the country and in the world that are in human care. Um, places like uh, SeaWorld and other oceanariums, and then also the U.S. Navy has uh, dolphins, beluga whales, and, and some pinnipeds that they use to help uh, protect our uh, national forces. So there are a number of reasons to be interested in the health of marine mammals, and very little is known about viruses in marine mammals. Humans are a single species, and we know of over 200 uh, pathogenic viruses. So that's not just all viruses, there are a lot more uh, viruses that are sort of commensal or, or symbiotes that don't really do any harm, 
but we know of over 200 that are uh, either cause illness or have the potential to cause illness. Contrast that with marine mammals, where there are over 120 species of marine mammals, and yet uh, about 10 years ago, when we first started getting involved in working with marine mammal viruses, there were only 29 uh, viruses known for all marine mammal species. So there's a lot of uh, room out there to, to learn more. But besides studying uh, viruses in marine mammals for marine mammals' sake, we also are interested in them because of the potential implications for human health. And so uh, this diagram doesn't show up probably very well, but this is um, the traditional perspective of public health or comparative medicine, which shows interlocking uh, circles here of human health, animal health, and environmental health. And that's the way we used to think about it, was there was a little bit of overlap here in the center, perhaps with uh, thinking about things like the food supply, making sure that animals are healthy so that they can produce food for humans. But there's a new uh, concept that's emerged um, in recent years called One Health. And the One Health paradigm looks a lot more like this, where the circles are nearly uh, overlapping. And uh, the One Health Initiative is a movement to really have um, more intimate uh, involvement between veterinarians and medical doctors and environmental scientists. And one of the reasons for that, that over, is that over 70% of the new and uh, re so emerging and resurging infectious diseases that affect human health are related to animals in some way. So almost three quarters of them by, by some estimates. And so we need to know what's going on with uh, animal populations in order to evaluate um, and protect our own health. And I'll give you a couple of uh, more specific examples. Um, there is a papillomavirus that um, causes, is associated with cervical cancer in uh, humans. And that same virus or, or sort of family of viruses is found in dolphins. Unlike in humans, the dolphins don't appear to get uh, cancer from these viruses. They can get the uh, warts that we see in humans as well, but they don't appear to get cancer. And so this is a, uh, this <clears throat> studying this uh, disease in dolphins might provide a model for uh, evaluating the disease in, in humans. Um, also, there's, uh, I mentioned the human food supply already. There's a disease called vesicular exanthema of swine. That's a good board question when you're in uh, veterinary school. That's a Khaleesi virus, and it affects uh, pigs. And one of the reasons it's very important is that the clinical signs of this virus look very much like foot and mouth disease which is a very scary disease that we really don't ever want to get in this country because it has the potential to completely uh, destroy our, our food supply. And so if you see a pig that has uh, signs of this Khaleesi virus, it's what's called a reportable disease. You have to report it to a USDA veterinarian immediately. Um, we haven't seen a vesicular exanthema of swine in the United States since about 1959. But in 1972, a virus was discovered in uh, sea lions that is virtually indistinguishable from uh, VES. And so there, again, is a, an example of why we need to be paying attention to wildlife diseases and marine wildlife diseases um, to protect human health and, and human food supply. Marine mammal populations and human populations are both uh, growing. And the number and density of marine mammals on haul-out sites uh, close to human centers of population is increasing. Um, interactions between humans and marine mammals are against the law. Um, but as we know, humans don't always uh, pay attention to that. As evidenced here with this top shelf, do not place anything on the top shelf. And right next to the sign, there's a whole bunch of boots on the top shelf. So typical of, uh, of what humans do. And so here's an example of a, a gentleman that's getting way too close to a northern elephant seal. Um, we also have people in very close proximity in uh, the San Diego area to uh, harbor seal haul out. And these are people overlooking a beach where there's a California sea lion female and uh, pup on the mainland coast. So very close contact, which uh, potentially can increase the risk of disease transmission from from marine mammals to humans. Um, and I will say that uh, we return the favor, unfortunately, um, with something called pathog pathogen pollution. 
And so uh, we all know about contaminant pollution and so on, but actually this, this term pathogen pollution has been coined because we're starting to see some diseases in marine mammals that are associated with terrestrial animals. And so, for example, there's a, a parasite, uh, Toxoplasma uh, gondii, which uh, is a disease of cats, and it's the disease um, that can uh, cause birth defects and other problems for pregnant women. It's why pregnant women are not supposed to garden and uh, clean out the litter box. This disease is causing uh, significant illness in, uh, or this organism is causing significant illness in California sea otters off the coast of California and has been implicated in the deaths of a couple of Hawaiian monk seals, which are an endangered species. And uh, it's thought to get into the marine environment through, um, through coastal runoff. So uh, as I mentioned, about 10 years ago, we started working with uh, marine mammal viruses. And with funding from the Department of uh, Defense and a number of partners, we set up a uh, Center for Marine Veterinary Virology. Um, we worked with virologists at the University of Florida and scientists at, at uh, SeaWorld and the Navy uh, Marine Mammal Program and then our organization. And we looked at uh, discovery and characterization of new viruses in primarily bottlenose dolphins and California sea lions. The reason for those two uh, animals being selected was uh, from the Department of Defense's point of view, they were the most, the highest priority species for them because these are animals that they have uh, under their care to help protect um, uh, nuclear submarines and all sorts of things uh, like that. Um, and so we worked with the uh, animals that were in the care of the Navy and SeaWorld um, and collected samples from them when uh, they became ill. And then we also had access to banked samples from routine health checks that had been conducted over the years. And then uh, Brent and I collected samples from California sea lions here out of the Channel Islands. Um, our research organization, uh, Hubs, has laboratories, two laboratories in Florida that does a lot of work with stranded animals. And so we had access to material from a lot of stranded bottlenose dolphins. And then we worked with the California Marine Mammal Stranding Network to collect samples from stranded California sea lions as well. So a mix of, of healthy and uh, not so healthy marine mammals and published a number of papers. Um, we discovered somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, new viruses. In other words, more or less doubled the number of known viruses. And we were specifically picking uh, viruses that were associated with disease or potentially associated with, with disease. So that's kind of how I got started in the marine mammal virus world. And then more recently, we've become, become associated with the Sears network. This is a, a uh, network that was set up by the National Institutes of Health, specifically the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And this is, uh, uh, SEERS stands for Centers of Excellence for Influenza Research and Surveillance. And the program was established to help implement the uh, recommendations of the, the U.S. Health and Human Services Pandemic Influenza Plan. And a pandemic is a global epidemic. So an epidemic is usually a localized outbreak of disease, but a pandemic is something that uh, goes global, or at least certainly beyond uh, more than one uh, country or continent. And so there's a, a plan to be on the lookout for uh, pandemic influenza, and that's what this network is all about. Our colleagues at UC Davis, who are partnering with us in this project, um, have been studying flu viruses in uh, unusual hosts, wild birds and uh, marine mammals since 2007, and then we joined the team in 2009. And so uh, first I'll give you a little primer on uh, influenza viruses. For those of you who aren't, aren't uh, real familiar with them, there are four types of flu viruses, A, B, C, and D. The ones we mostly worry about are influenza A and influenza B. Those are the ones that are uh, associated with disease in humans. Influenza C causes mild respiratory illness, uh, really not associated with outbreaks. And influenza D occurs uh, primarily in cattle and is not known to be a human pathogen. So influenza A is the one that gets all the press because uh, of the way that it uh, changes over time. And so flu, virus, flu viruses are constantly changing. As they're replicating, they're changing. 
And there's two ways that flu viruses can change. One is called antigenic shift, and one is called antigenic drift. And so antigenic drift is the sort of day-to-day -day gradual change in the structure of the flu virus that happens season to season. And so you've got, if you get the flu this year, likely you will uh, have pretty good protection if there's an antigenic shift in the flu virus next year because it's a, a pretty small change. So A, a viruses and B viruses both change by this antigenic uh, drift. I'm sorry, I think I mixed it up, drift. I think of drifting. Only influenza A viruses um, undergo what's known as an antigenic shift. And that's a major change in the nature of the virus. Um, such a big change that the flu vaccine wouldn't work against it and uh, you wouldn't have immunity to fight it. And um, it's an abrupt uh, change that one year the flu looks like this, the next year it looks like that. And because of that, that's the reason that influenza A viruses are the ones that we focus on mostly because they pose the biggest risk of uh, serious disease because we're unprepared for them, essentially. Um, flu viruses are further characterized by the uh, proteins that are found on their surfaces. And the flu virus is generally um, targeted at these uh, spiky things here, these proteins on their surface. And so you may have heard uh, people talk about H1N1 or H5N1, H3, so on. And so they're, um, they're classified depending on what type of hemagglutinin and neuramididase they have. And so H1N1, for example, is one of the flu viruses, influenza A, H1N1, is one of the flu viruses that is very common in the human population right now. H3N8 is an influenza A virus that uh, caused a outbreak of flu in harbor seals in 2011 in New England. And a different H3N8 uh, virus from horses jumped into greyhound dogs in Florida in 2004 and now is widespread in dogs throughout the United States. So just uh, if you're a real flu geek, then you, you really want to be able to characterize these as, as carefully as you can. And so again, the influenza A viruses, because they can change by this, uh, make this major change, the antigenic shift, um, they pose the greatest risk to human health because we're not prepared for them. So what about influenza A in marine mammals? It was first recognized in marine mammals in, 19, uh, in the 1980s. And it's very difficult to actually find the virus in an animal or a human because viruses usually only shed for a brief period of time. And you usually don't uh, develop clinical signs until you have been shedding virus for two or three days. And you may only shed for two or three days. So it's difficult to actually find the virus, but it has been found in uh, two pinnipeds and one cetacean. What we generally look for instead of the virus itself is antibodies to the virus as evidence that you've been exposed. So the antibodies are your body's reaction to uh, the virus itself. And uh, antibodies have been detected in a number of marine mammal species, seals, sea lions, walruses, uh, whales, dolphins, and sea otters. In most cases with marine mammals, there's no sign of illness uh, when we detect antibodies or, or virus. Um, the exception would be harbor seals, where there have been big die-offs of harbor seals along the East Coast uh, in New England that have been associated with influenza A viruses. And aquatic birds are thought to be the reservoir for all influenza A viruses, including those that are found in marine mammals. And so if you've heard of the bird flu, that's an influenza A virus. That's a super scary uh, virus that we're, we're worried about getting into the human population. So as I mentioned, we're part of this national team that is uh, doing surveillance for flu viruses. And SEERS, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a program of the National Institutes of Health in the United States. But, but you can see here that they are sampling and keeping an eye on things worldwide. And so they're keeping an eye on uh, routine uh, viruses, how the virus changes a little bit year to year um, so that uh, public health um, scientists can develop the appropriate vaccines, um, kind of make predictions as they see how things are shaping up in various areas of the world and then uh, provide advice for vaccine manufacture. But they're also keeping an eye out for these really scary um, 
new viruses that may be emerging in either humans or in animals. And so we've been involved in the animal surveillance part of it, specifically uh, looking with, with marine mammals. And so what we've been doing out at the Channel Islands, primarily San Miguel and San Nicolas Island, um, is uh, collecting nasal and rectal swabs from uh, seals and sea lions. And they were uh, evaluated by PCR or polymerase chain uh, reaction. And then if anything was detected, which I'll cut to the chase and tell you it wasn't, we did not detect the actual uh, virus in the animals. Um, we would have gone on to virus isolation and uh, sequencing as needed. We've also been collecting blood samples from all of the animals and, uh, and doing uh, uh, various kinds of tests looking for antibodies to, to flu virus with northern elephant seals, California sea lions, and harbor seals. And so um, fortunately, pandemic type flu viruses only occur very rarely. Um, but in 2009, one did emerge, and that was the first pandemic flu virus in over 40 years. It emerged in the San Diego area, and it was a virus that had both bird, uh, pig, and human genes. And as I said, it emerged in the spring of 2009 and spread worldwide. You didn't hear a lot about it, about it in the news. It certainly wasn't the same as the 1918 Spanish flu that killed millions of people because fortunately it wasn't a real virulent flu, but it did spread like wildfire. Well, we found exposure to that exact same virus in marine mammals out at the Channel Islands. And we can tell by genetic testing that it was the same virus. And so the paper we published here, this is the, characterizes the virus. So it's an influenza A virus, H1N1 that we talked about. And then this PDM um, up, is an abbreviation for pandemic, 09. So it's the pandemic virus from 2009, influenza A, H1N1. Elephant seals appear particularly susceptible um, to infection and epidemic transmission of the virus. Over half of the elephant seals that we sampled had antibodies to the virus. And I mentioned that we didn't actually uh, culture virus in elephant seals, but our colleagues at UC Davis did. They found the actual virus in two northern elephant seal females on the central California coast. So we tested, as I mentioned, California sea lions and harbor seals. Only about 10% of them tested positive. And that's still a pretty high uh, percentage. We, we look for um, all kinds of infectious diseases in marine mammals through the course of our research. And finding 5% to 10% prevalence um, is pretty significant. So, to find over half of the animals testing positive for this virus was a very startling uh, finding. And we found that it was very widespread as well, not just uh, localized to a couple of islands, but, but uh, throughout the chain and then up and down the coast of California. It was found in stranded animals as well. We sampled animals through the, through the stranding network. And so our next steps, what we're next gonna be working on is trying to determine whether or not elephant seals uh, might be a reservoir for pandemic flu viruses. And one of the reasons that we're concerned about this is uh, part of the study involved uh, capturing animals more than once during the breeding season. So we would catch females and their pups multiple times during the nursing season and collect samples. And what we found was that the, in some of the pups, the antibody titers or amount of antibody present went up four times. And that can be an indirect measure of infection. So even when, you, when you're sick and you uh, go in to, to be tested for a virus, if they don't find virus, sometimes what they'll do is, but they do find antibodies, sometimes they'll have you come back a couple of weeks later and see if that titer has gone up, which suggests that there's virus somewhere because you're continuing to, to kind of fight it and develop antibodies to it. So that was uh, very suspicious. And... Um, so it suggests that either the virus is still uh, circulating in the population or, and or the pups are getting uh, antibodies from their mothers through maternal transfer. And the only way to tell uh, which of those it is is by many years of continued sampling. If the virus was a one-off that everybody got exposed to, humans and marine mammals at the same time, then we would expect over time the prevalence to be slowly uh, decreasing. 
um, and so far we're, we are um, just beginning to see some fall off in the, in the prevalence of the, of the virus. So we, we need to continue to, to uh, sample to see if it's circulating in the population. The other thing we really want to know is whether or not elephant seals can serve as mixing vessels for flu viruses. Um, some of you may uh, know that uh, sometimes we talk about, um, in a particular year, a swine flu, and those tend to be kind of nasty flus. Um, one of the reasons for that is that pigs in their lungs have receptor for both bird flu viruses and mammal flu viruses. So they can be affected by, infected by more than one flu virus at the same time, which is uh, just a recipe for this type of antigenic shift that I was talking about, where you could get exchanges of genes between bird viruses and mammal viruses, and even more scary, not just any mammal virus, but potentially a human uh, virus. And so that's why people are really worried about uh, the next big pandemic that's gonna cause um, lots of deaths in humans coming from birds, this bird flu. If that were to get into a pig at the same time a mammal virus was in a pig, um, a very deadly version of the flu could emerge. And we're wondering if this same thing could happen with uh, seals. Um, harbor seals, we know that they have receptors for both mammalian and bird viruses. And so we're doing some investigating now, looking at animals that, uh, that die and uh, collecting samples from their, from their lungs. Or, and our colleagues at UC Davis are looking to see if both receptors are, are present there. And so why do we care about uh, pandemic viruses? Um, we, we talk about flu, two types of flu, the seasonal flu, which is your uh, sort of plain vanilla flu and the pandemic flu. So seasonal flu is over here. Um, we talked about it. It usually peaks uh, January or February worldwide in the United States. It's more like uh, December through, through February. You usually have a little bit of immunity year to year built up. We usually don't have Every once in a while, there's a shortage of vaccine, uh, <clears throat> but usually we're able to keep up with the demand. And our scientists do a pretty good job of predicting um, how to mix up the flu vaccine for the next year. We have a good stockpile of antiviral drugs so that if vulnerable people do become exposed, they can be treated. And so it's really uh, has a pretty small effect on the economy <clears throat> and on, on public health. Pandemic flus, however, completely different story. Fortunately, they happen very rarely. Only three times in the 20th century have we, or, or did we have uh, pandemic flu viruses? And we've had one now, as I mentioned, in the 21st century, in 2009. Um, we have, humans have little or no immunity to these viruses when they emerge, and they uh, potentially can have widespread um, impact. They can overwhelm the public health uh, system exhaust our supplies of vaccine, exhaust our supplies of antivirals. Generally with pandemic flus, it's not just the um, elderly and young people and people with weakened immune systems who get sick and die, but um, even healthy uh, people can get sick and die. And so the mortality rate is generally 10 to 100 times, uh, at least in a pandemic flu outbreak, what it is in a seasonal flu. And then getting back to this, this number here, we know <clears throat> that it's not just the flu, but about 70% of the, of the serious emerging diseases in humans are associated with, with animals in some way. And you see them listed there. <coughs> Ebola virus with primates and bats, <coughs> West Nile, SARS, hantavirus, and flu. <coughs> Excuse me all associated with animals in one way or another. And so I mentioned <clears throat> that Health and Human Services is worried about this, and so they produced this gigantic uh, document called a Pandemic Influenza Plan. I believe the last one was in 2005. It's just been updated, 2017. And so they come up with their recommendations for, for what needs to be done to deal with uh, pandemic flu. And so of the uh, seven <clears throat> things that they say that we should be doing, our project falls in number one here, this surveillance, and then learning about the epidemiology or the evolution of the viruses. 
And we are right now in what's called the inter-pandemic phase. We're between pandemics. And so when you're in a pandemic, of course, you're mostly focused on treating people, developing vaccine as quickly as you can. But with the inter-pandemic phase, the in, uh, emphasis is on research, investigation, not just in animals <clears throat> or not just in people, but also in animals. And this is an interesting little chart that they put together that uh, is a way to evaluate risk of different flu viruses for human health. And so on this axis is a measure of clinical severity. So how sick you get when you get the flu, not very sick, extremely sick. And then on this axis is the measure of transmissibility. So how easy the virus is passed from person to person, not very and very. And so over here is that uh, Spanish flu epidemic that killed many, millions of people. It was extremely transmissible and it made people very, very sick. This 2009 pandemic sits right here. So as I mentioned, it wasn't super transmissible, didn't make people super sick, but it did cross the line between the low severity, which is where the seasonal, this says seasonal range, seasonal flus fit into the area where uh, it, it's uh, classified as uh, pandem pandemic flu. So this is the type of research that's done with, uh, with the data that are collected on, on viruses in, in people and humans uh, around the world. And so that's uh, it for the presentation. I wanna acknowledge my um, collaborating institutions. Um, these are the, the groups that are part of the SEERS. These organizations are part of the SEERS a network that's looking at novel viruses in unusual hosts, the birds and, and marine mammals. And these are uh, co-authors on the paper that we uh, published showing the flu virus in, in elephant seals. And many thanks to the National Park for providing us with access to uh, San Miguel Island and to the Navy for giving us access to uh, San Nicolas Island. And then you can see some of our funding sources and acknowledgement for, uh, for graphics. Um, I've got one other uh, little quiz question that I wanted to ask you. So we heard that the seasonal flu, or I, I mentioned that the seasonal flu doesn't cause uh, a lot of uh, illness compared to the pandemic flu. And I'm gonna give you three numbers and I wanna see a show of hands with how many people uh, pick, pick the different numbers. How many deaths per year since 2010, so these are annual number of deaths, does the CDC estimate the flu causes? Is it 25 million, 35 million, or 45 million? So this is deaths that the CDC estimates per year just from the seasonal flu. So 25, 35, 45. 25, okay, 35, 45, it's 35. So between nine, 9 million and 36 million deaths per year, even from just the seasonal flu. So if you multiply that by 10 or 100, that's what we're looking at uh, with a pandemic flu. So um, it's worth, uh, I think it's worth the work that we're doing with the swabs and the blood samples out there at the islands. So thank you very much for your attention. I asked you guys some questions, now it's your turn. <laughs> uh, well, I'm a boater, so I get close to marine uh, birds and rocks and their, uh, you know, their lifestyle, they don't really clean up after themselves. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I've been on Santa Barbara Island where you actually walk around the only landing spot, you have to walk right near the pinnipeds not where the rookery is. Uh, does that increase my chances of getting some infection? Um, you know, the, it's a good question about whether being around uh, wildlife, in, in, particularly in a uh, more intimate setting like, like you just described, increases your risk of getting infection. And I think the sort of common sense things that your mom taught you about washing your hands and uh, you know, being careful, um, hold for whether you're walking around a farm 
or uh, with your pets or playing with little kids who are uh, you know, exposed to diseases at school and so on. So I think a lot of those common sense um, things still apply in terms of washing your hands and so on. Um, flu viruses are primarily spread through aerosol uh, or droplets. So, you know, somebody sneezes or coughs. Um, they can, though, uh, survive in the environment to a certain extent. So up to 48 hours uh, in some circumstances. So, uh, you know, if a bird sneezed on you, um, <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, just washing your hands and being careful with your clothes and uh, things like that is... Uh, Again, just like you would if you were horseback riding or going to a farm or, or hanging out with pets or um, kids that were running around with a, with a runny nose. In your second to last slide, you showed the, I think it was the plan of 2017 to deal with the pandemic. You said that the, the virus that was in 2009 was mild and the pandemic. So where would the classification be in the um, 1918 flu? Um, let's see if I can go back to that slide. Yeah, it's the, it was the one that was in the far right hand, upper right corner. So it was in the extreme of the transmissibility and the extreme of the severity. So that's as bad as it that's gets. That's as bad as it gets, yeah. Yeah, good way to put it. That's, as, that's, as, that's the worst flu we've ever seen. And so that's why it's up in that corner. I read where that, that people. <clears throat> Healthy people. Yes. Healthy people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And who knows why that is? I've heard that too, that actually um, younger people were disproportionately affected. Um, one of the hypotheses that I've heard is that they were the ones who were out uh, more likely to be exposed. And, uh, you know, elderly people are more likely to maybe would have stayed home or uh, didn't need to be out in the workplace or something. But but that is a characteristic of the pandemic flu is that even young, healthy people are affected. Should we have a concern with the, the medications we have that get washed down into the ocean that people wear? Is this uh, deal in any way with the resistance uh, and the ability of these things to uh, multiply? Uh, <clears throat> that's a really good question. And uh, there's a big concern about uh, antibiotic use in, in pets and in livestock and in people, overuse. But as you mentioned, um, runoff into the environment is also a significant concern. Um, there have been studies that have been done in uh, sharks, for example, in some areas in Florida where they have cultured uh, organisms from these sharks and found that they're very uh, resistant to antibiotics. And of course, they should be pretty naive to those antibiotics, right? Because these are wild sharks that have never been treated. Um, we even see some antibiotic resistance now in uh, some animals in Antarctica. So it's, uh, it is a concern, and that's why uh, a lot of pharmacies now, um, in fact, most will take um, or have amnesty uh, periods or will take uh, medications back from you if you have unused uh, medication so that you don't um, you know, flush it down the toilet or let it get into our waterways. There are other uh, recommendations that you can find them online at the uh, county health or talk to your doctor about them, things like grinding the medication up and putting it in coffee grounds and then throwing it away, things like that, again, to make sure that it doesn't get into the water supply. Yeah, good, good question. Speaking about that last topic, oh, sorry. That would just apply to uh, bacterial and perhaps fungal diseases if it's an antimycotic, because there aren't that many antivirals around. So I don't know if it would really apply that much to viruses. Yeah, you know, that's a good point because most of the antivirals are, um, <clears throat> they're used much less often because they need to be given very early in the course of the, of the disease. Um, but they, that is one of the things that Sears is looking at besides how uh, good our vaccines are, they're always on the lookout for viruses that appear to be resistant to the antivirals. And whether that's because, um, you know, they've been, the virus has been exposed to it, or it's just the virus has mutated and adapted to the point where it's no longer um, susceptible to the antiviral. Um, but you're right, where we, where we mostly see resistance being a problem is with um, bacteria and, uh, and fungal organisms.
Any <clears throat> any more questions? Yeah. Back to the nineteen eighteen flu. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I really I really thought that was interesting. So is the was that a shift? Was there? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was. And we didn't, you know, we weren't doing the, the type of research uh, in as much depth as we are now. But yes, that was something that uh, just emerged very suddenly, was very different from anything that uh, people had been exposed to before. And that's why we saw, you know, so people didn't have any immunity to it at all. And so that's why it was, and it also happened to be a very hot flu. So it was a very virulent flu, spread like wildfire. And that was one of the reasons why um, people got so sick. You know, one of the, the uh, this whole wildlife surveillance thing um, came about in part because um, we've seen some sort of scary viruses emerging in, uh, in Asia. And one of the reasons that uh, people think that that may be happening is that there are areas where there are either markets or uh, rural neighborhoods where people may have, um, a family may have a couple of pigs and some ducks and they're living in real uh, close contact with each other, possibly even coming into the house. And so there you've got that opportunity for the bird virus, the mammal virus, um, you know, the pig virus, and potentially the human virus to mix. And then as I mentioned, wild birds uh, are the reservoir or for a lot of these viruses. And so the concern is that um, the viruses in Asia may be spreading you know, throughout, the, throughout the world, um, being carried by these birds as they're migrating. And so we, we've been studying primarily marine mammals. We did do a little bit of sampling of uh, seabirds out of the islands as well. But there are other groups that are um, associated with this Sears group that are really looking at uh, waterfowl that hunters have collected. And so there are programs where they're uh, sampling um, dead uh, ducks and geese and so on and, and surveying them for some of these scary flu viruses, concerned that they may be coming in as I said, uh, on, the, on the migratory pathway. And of course, marine mammals move long distances too. So elephant seals in particular. So that's uh, something that we're, uh, we're concerned about. Um, as far as transmission, vi virus transmission, is that has to be close contact between uh, organisms, right? So it, can't, it can't be transmitted in the water because they're all in the ocean. Right. But bacterial and the other things are the ones that spread out on their own. Right. Yeah. We, don't, we don't think that uh, flu viruses can be uh, transmitted through seawater. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's usually the, the um, aerosol, you know, somebody coughs or an animal coughs or something. It can be, um, they can survive, though, uh, 24 to 48 hours in the environment. So you can, uh, you know, have it on your clothes and, and transmit it from place to place. Um, or kid can get exposed at school and bring it home, you know, things like that can happen. Or it could be out in the environment. I mean, that's one of the things we're curious about is how does these elephant seals get exposed, you know, to, to the virus. We do have, um, there are documented cases of uh, flu viruses going from uh, birds to marine mammals. And there's one case of a flu virus, um, one case that I'm aware of going from a marine mammal to a human. And in that case, it was a, an eye infection. The human got kind of a conjunctivitis, not really a, a severe respiratory infection. So, um, and, and that was in a setting where uh, the person was working pretty closely with the, with the animal. So that's a good, that's a good point. Um, really just a comment. Um, Dr. Yoka mentioned that um, of the elephant seals we sampled in particular, we found that uh, half of them had been exposed to this influenza A virus. Um, and it was striking, I think, to us to follow up on that. We didn't see any evidence of mortality or, or morbidity in any of the elephant seals that we were observing then or since, and our colleagues in other places didn't either, which is striking uh, for another reason. And I think um, if some of you know the history of northern elephant seals, they were uh, reduced to maybe a couple of dozen by the late uh, 1900s, 1800s. And, um, have been growing exponentially. They were presumed extinct and actually attempted uh, attempts to extinguish them in the late 1800s. But in any event, there were very few of them and they all came back from a few dozen perhaps or maybe a hundred, but a very small number. And they've been growing exponentially ever since um, the early 1900s. And one of the, the scientific 
um, hypotheses that came out about the same time that elephant seals were recovering is that animals that go through these population bottlenecks also undergo genetic bottlenecks. So their genetic variation is reduced. And so there was some early work with northern elephant seals with proteins. Uh, at the time, it was the technique that was being used. So enzymes, which are expressions of the genetic composition, genetic variability in the, the genes that uh, exist in the animal system. And um, it was found that those enzymes didn't vary at all in the elephant seal population. So it suggested they were all identical, suggesting that when they went through, uh, elephant seals went through this population bottleneck, they also lost um, virtually all of their genetic variability and they were effectively twins. So that's, that was surprising to combine with the fact that we didn't see any mortality because the, the, set, the, cor the correlative hypothesis that came out of this genetic bottleneck issue was that if you don't have any genetic variability or if you have very little in your system, in the species system, that you're very susceptible to any new thing that comes along and you could be wiped out. And there were some uh, examples at the time that uh, might have supported that. So we, were, we would expect if, a, if a, this a virus like this came through that's lethal to some extent, we would have seen some mortality, we would have seen some morbidity, particularly in an animal that had virtually no variability. And we've looked at other systems, so it was, well, maybe the enzymes that were looked at weren't reflective of what was really there. So we've looked at markers in nuclear DNA with colleagues and in markers in mitochondrial DNA, and we found the same thing, that there was no detectable variability in those systems. We even looked at um, genes that code for um, responses to uh, pathogens. And uh, we found no variability there either. So it's been really surprising to us how elephant seals with uh, no apparent ability, genetic availability, uh, uh, um, no genetic, um, well, with no, but they have no ability to respond to new um, challenges to their system, came through this with high exposure and evidence uh, without any mortality and morbidity. So we're a bit, um, puzzled by all of this, but uh, elephant seals are survivors. So we're still looking at trying to understand how this happens. But it was a statement that, well, perhaps genetic variability and low genetic variability doesn't uh, predispose you to uh, instant mortality and, and catastrophe. But we're not sure why they, they weren't um, affected by the virus in a, in a lethal way. And we're still trying to sort that out. Is that? If you would have, if you would have asked me to predict uh, when the study started, um, of the three species that we sampled, which would be most likely to have the flu viruses, I would have said harbor seals, hands down. Because on the East Coast, they have been repeatedly, uh, there have been die-offs of harbor seals associated with flu viruses. And what, yet we found very low prevalence, at least for this one, uh, to this one virus. What we found instead was that the elephant seals were, uh, had obviously been exposed to it. <clears throat> but as Brent says, they, they apparently weren't phased by it. Although sometimes it's hard to tell, right? They're laying on the beach. <laughs> they kind of have bilateral nasal discharge all the time anyway. But, uh, but the blood work that we did, and, and uh, we never saw them coughing. And you know, when I listened to their lungs and all of that, they, they, uh, they didn't seem to be uh, suffering from the, from the flu. So do these animals let you get that close to them? Good question. No, they don't. Uh, and uh, one of the pictures there was, uh, uh, was a Brent getting uh, some things ready. So for the um, for animals that are small enough to restrain, uh, we can uh, get samples just by uh, you know getting in quickly and, and holding them. The other ones had to be anesthetized. Although I have to say, both Brent and I got very good um, with the swabs, just sneaking up and collecting samples while they were asleep. So you just wait for them to exhale, <laughs> take a little swab, and then back away. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to a Penn State researcher on standard problems, and that person told me that you know at any one time there can be thirty or forty thousand of these guys on that beach out there, but they have a die-off of. You know, sometimes 20% or 30% of their pups. Is that because they just don't have resistance to these different kinds of diseases? Actually, actually you know, with, with wildlife in general, um, infant mortality, you know, or neonate mortality of 40 or 50% is, is not that unusual. 
So it's tough, you know, the, the first year of life and uh, not just when you're a pup on the beach, but that transition to independence um, is really tough. So once you're weaned, um, you know, there are people in the audience here who work with the stranding network and by far the, the uh, age group that strands most often is the, is the young animals. We have seen um, some diseases go through the, through the population here though that have caused um, morbidity or illness and, and mortality. Um, leptospirosis is a bacterial disease, for example, that kind of cycles through the population uh, every so often. Um, there's uh, this protozoal disease that I mentioned that's um, affecting sea otters. We've also seen that in some of the uh, uh, pinniped species. Um, there was a coronavirus a few years ago that, that caused a die off in, uh, in some harbor seals. Um, there are some uh, other viruses that are associated with gastrointestinal disease that seem to be present in sea lions in fairly low levels. Only rarely do we actually see you know, diarrhea or, or uh, any clinical signs associated with them. So there are things that are out there uh, that, are, that are making them sick. But I think with the, with the young ones, it's mostly um, you know, premature separation from the, from the female or just um, it's just a rough way. Uh, it's, it, it's tough out there for, for young marine mammals. Um, I, and with these pups, I think at San Miguel, they're northern fur seals and California sea lions. With northern fur seals, there's this hookworm that um, causes some pup mortality. In some years, that's that's pretty high for them, and it gets up to forty to sixty percent in some summers. Um, and those are all very young pups that are probably one to four weeks old. California sea lions, and we've seen this, and there's been a lot of media coverage of this the last, especially the last five years. Um, most of that mortality has been related to uh, a lack of food. So the females are, are leaving, and they're leaving their pups on the beach after they give birth. And the females are going out and finding food, and they're bringing uh, that back in the form of milk. And then they're, they're nursing the, the pups. And it, we've had a couple of years, and one particular one, Ron might remember it, uh, where there were several thousand pups that were uh, stranded on the mainland coast, but those all came from California, uh, the Channel Islands. And um, they were coming ashore as they were getting older and they were becoming a little more um, independent of their mothers, or the mothers just stopped coming back because there wasn't food. And we had one year where it seemed like there was catastrophic failure of food supply in the Southern California Bight, apparently related to a change in wind patterns, there was no upwelling, and there was no food in summer and fall to support um, uh, fish populations. They either didn't, uh, they either went deeper or they moved out of the Southern California bite or they weren't productive. So a lot of that mortality, particularly for California sea lions in some years, and it gets up to 70 to 80% some years, is um, ecosystem failure, a food chain failure in Southern California. Uh, bite where the females are are foraging or attempting to forage, and they can only go so far. Their range is limited, and they're bringing those those nutrients they get back in the form of the milk that the pups are counting on. And the pups are abandoned. That's really the first response of these females and long-lived species. If they're food stressed, they just abandon the young because uh, they'll survive and produce more. So I think that's the mortality that it's, uh, and we've seen it at San Nicolas, and it's been pulse, it's been periodic. It's San Miguel, but we've seen the last five years it's happened several times. This seems to be, have been a pretty good year for um, upwelling and food production in Southern California. Might. What year was that, Ron? 13. 13. Okay. We went through in three years ago, and one in particular where there was a huge number of strandings and, and pup mortality. We have time for one last question. Okay, so I'm thinking elephant seals are um, metabolism is probably a lot slower than most. Is that true? Um, you know, they it it depends. Let me put okay. it that way. Whether, I'm just, well, whether they're sleeping or, or resting or. So uh, what I'm wondering is maybe yeah. they survived all of this because they they spent so much time in this low metabolism phase where. I, they just didn't. Uh, Hard to tell. You know, take... it, that, that 2009 virus wasn't particularly deadly for humans either. And so um, maybe it just was a, a virus that, uh, you know, didn't cause a lot of 
illness and you know, serious illness in people and didn't cause a lot of serious illness in, in elephant seals. Um, as I said, they weren't clinically sick in the sense that uh, you know they were coughing and so on, but even the, the blood work that we did, sometimes you can see indications of a viral infection in terms of what cells are, go up and down uh, in, the, in the blood. And even there, I didn't see any hints of um, really of subclinical disease either. So uh, for whatever reason, they seem to, to sort of shrug this virus off. Well, the, I'll, just, I'll just say that uh, vaccination in wildlife is very controversial. There have been some spectacular failures, and, uh, but there have also been some successes. And uh, actually, we've been involved in, in helping to develop uh, distemper vaccination protocols for, for seals. And so wouldn't it be cool if we could uh, prevent human disease by vaccinating you know, animals instead of people someday? All right, thanks again. Great questions. Thank you.